Yeah, so really what I wanted to talk with you today, Alex, is a little bit just a primer and objection handling. Um, so uh, some of the things to go over is uh, just the fact that as a SDR, BDR here, when we're cold calling, we're going to have, um, you are going, th this is like one of the most important skills to learn. Um, and uh, so I want to give you some tools and then we'll just, uh, Briefly go into them. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, awesome. So there's one principle that I want to talk about. Um, so in reaching out to people, you have different options. You can reach out by email, by LinkedIn, by phone, by video advertisement. So if you've ever got one of those emails that like someone actually has embedded a video into it, that's the fourth option. But some people, uh, I'm going to be fully transparent with you. Like, um, Calling on the phone can be exhausting sometimes for many people. And the reason why is because it's just nerve wracking and then it just like drains your emotions. But one of the facts that matter is that like just from a data driven perspective, calling people is one of the most direct ways of getting engagement. So I just want to give you some data. Um, in Q3 of this year, we connected with 32,000 people and we created two outreach uh sequences. So this one over here, we connected with 28,000 people. It's all email, no phone. And this second one over here, this next row, it is literally the exact same sequence, except it starts out with a cold call. So you can see over here, this is the 3.5% meeting set rate for the pure email. And then the exact same email messaging starting out with a call is over double the conversion rate as just using email. Um, so uh, a lot of people avoid calling. Please call because it's the one of the most direct ways to your number. Okay. All right. Awesome. So I, I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, handling um, like objections when you are... Um, when you are cold calling and in sales in general. So in New York City, there was a large insurance company and it would hire all these junior salespeople fresh out of college. And so it's hiring people from Harvard. It's also hiring people from state schools, right? Uh, many different ethnicities, mm -hmm. backgrounds, different degrees. And they analyzed actually who was most successful because they were collecting all this data of hiring people year after year after year. So what do you think was one of the number one indicators of future success for these junior salespeople? Ooh, I mean, good interpersonal communication, obviously. Uh, do you think that's I, number one? Um, Maybe rapport building. Uh, or building relationships. Yeah. Important ability to build relationships yeah um if so that was definitely on the list the number one reason for people being successful in sales over the long time horizon versus who wasn't it wasn't where they went to school it wasn't what they studied it wasn't their involvement in student activities it literally was their ability to handle rejection so the people who could handle rejection well um they were the ones that were more successful. The people who didn't, they would quit in a year. Okay. Wow. Um, so like the way that I sort of think about it is when I started out in sales, um, it was kind of intimidating, but I just changed my mentality, which is just sort of like, one, it was very important for me to believe, really believe in the product that it could help people. So from a place of authenticity, I could go out and try to like, just really believe in the product. The second thing is having this mentality of just like being very persistent. So some I used to teach in public schools. Some kids used to, you know, they just ask and they ask and then some kids get whatever they want. You know what I mean? Right. But some kids like are really like, you know, they ask, they, they don't get it and then they get mad and then you don't want to give it to them even more. So in all honesty, one of the other things that I found is just sort of like being persistent and having a little bit of a spirit like a kid of just like continually asking. Um, so, all right. Um, 
the most common objections that we have over here really fall into three categories. Number one, competitive. We already have one of these other providers and it's usually GitHub and Azure DevOps. Uh, so number one, competitive. Number two is indifference. Um, so like just to understand where they're at, imagine if you're super, super, super busy and you have a full plate, uh, migrating from one tool to another, like you ever like move from one apartment to another and it's like stressful and you have to figure out all the logistics and it takes a long time and you have to get your friends, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. So migrating, we have to understand that migrating from one tool to another, it actually takes a lot of work. And just like how moving from one apartment to the next is like, it honestly takes you like six weeks to feel normal again. It's sort of the same thing for migrating from tools. And a lot of people they'll say, hey, you know what, right now it's not the right time. You're super busy. We're happy as we are. So they don't really want to change. That's That's probably another really common objection that we have. Third objection that we have is cost. Uh, so some people object to us because, uh, they're either using the free tier and they don't want to upgrade. Um, sometimes they think that our tiers are too expensive, but it's mainly competitive indifference or cost. Cool. Uh, can I help out with any of the slides so far? Oh, no, that's all pretty clear right now. Okay, cool. Uh, so I like to take a teacher's mentality. Um, what's the answer for some of these different objections? Um, if it's competitive, some things that I can do to probe is like, hey, you'd never have a perfect solution. So if you could change one thing about your current solution, what would you do? What are some of the things that like you wish you had, right? right. Another way that like uh, I can break over the conversation is talking about security testing. This is something that people care a lot about right now. So it can hook people's interest. Um, and then in terms of indifference, these are the people that it's like, hey, I don't really like my apartment very much, but I really just don't want to move right now. Right. That's actually a lot of people. Right. Some questions that I ask is like, okay, well, what's what's the cost of you not moving, right? So how much time do you spend maintaining your software tooling? Are you happy with how your tooling supports your development, right? So it, it doesn't fit your needs. So like, hey, I understand you don't want to go move apartments right now, but are you are you happy with like, you know, that your quality of life in your apartment? Like how's the noise, right? Like no. are, what, what challenges do you have with your current apartment? Number three is cost is uh, we can actually save people money. And the reason why is because if you have 10 software tools and then you reduce it down to five, then all, you start saving money from day zero. And the power of GitLab is that we can actually consolidate your tool chain. Okay. Sure. All right. So I want to talk about uh, four techniques. Um, these are four. It's just sort of like, um, like in basketball. You can have a jump shot, but you also need to get a layup. You also want to have a floater. You can, if you have like a drop step type of like, you just want different ways because you're one dimensional if you only have like one way, right? Right. Um. So it's really important that we have all four. Oh, so the reason why is because if you have one call and it's 15 minutes long, they might give you three, four, five different objections. So if you're using the same objection handling technique over and over again, then it just sounds really robotic. You see what I mean? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first one is feel felt found. Um, this is the most common one and I'll just use it. So it's like, hey, I totally understand that you have GitHub. Um, you know, like the fact of the matter is uh, if, if, um, you know, many businesses have GitHub today and the cost of migration actually is large, like you said. But what I found, however, is that if people stick with a platform like GitHub, they don't actually have all of the functionality built into a single platform, which means that they're actually going to have to buy additional software tools and maintain multiple tools. So... Um, what we've actually found is by, by consolidating to a single application with something like GitLab, it actually saves people a lot of time and sometimes money as well. So that's mm -hmm. a feel felt found. So I'm just going to show a video real quick and let me know if um, if the audio quality is OK. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Big fan of a lot of the traditional sales. Is it sound, sound OK? Right? Yeah. Sometimes there's 
one or two techniques that I like that I keep on my on my tool belt. And today I want to share one of those with you. And that is the three F methods. So let me give you a little bit of context. Let's say you're talking to a prospect and you are getting resistance, right? They're giving you objections. Just like almost like, like martial art. They're throwing a lot of punches at you. No, 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 no. Why they're not taking action today, right? And they're giving you a lot of objections. So instead of fighting force with force, right? Instead of they give you resistance and you fight with force, what you want to do is kind of do a little bit of redirection. And the way you do that is through what I call a 3F method. And that's feel, felt, found. Feel, felt, found. Now, very, very simple. So what you want to do is, first of all, whenever you get resistance and they give you an objection, first, you need to have empathy. Don't fight, don't argue. Say, you know what? I understand how you feel, right? I understand how you feel, felt. Others felt the same way. You explain, and then here's what I found. Feel, felt, found. Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want to do it like a, like a robot, right? When you get an, get an objection, Oh yeah, I know exactly how you feel and others, customers felt the same way. And what I found is this is simply not true. That's not what I'm talking about. It is a, a formula. So during the feel phase, you might say something like, I understand your concern. If I were in your shoes, I would have similar concern as well. Or you might say something like, I could see where you're coming from. I understand. See, so you don't necessarily have to use the feel word, right? But it's a step. Step one, empathy. Step two, felt. Now it could be you felt the same way or other customers share the same concern. And here's the conclusion. What they found or what I found is this. So let me quickly demonstrate. Let's do an example where let's say I'm talking to a friend, right? I'm trying to persuade them. And I would say something like, let's say I want to convince them of taking vitamins. Very simple idea. And I would say, say, no, you know, Dad, I never take vitamins. I never believe in these things. Hey, man, you know what? I, I understand. I totally get it, right? I used to believe in the same thing. I don't, I don't take vitamins. I don't need vitamins. I, I get enough nutrition just from the day-to-day -day food. And what I realize is there are actually many different types of vitamins. And when you take the right vitamin, as such as this brand, right? When I take it, what I found is every morning when I take it, I actually have more energy throughout the day, right? And I'm more focused that I could, I'm more productive that my mind is more clear and I get sick less just by taking these couple of vitamins. You see how that works? Feel, felt, found. Let me give you an example. Let's say you offer digital marketing services to, let's say, traditional business owner that they don't know much about digital marketing or social media. They're still doing very old school type marketing. Let's say you want to close them on your digital marketing services. And they say to you, no, I don't believe in this social media, Facebook things and all these things that I don't like, I don't understand how it works. Dude. I don't know, I don't think even they even work, right? I don't think they work. Hey, Mr. Business Owner, I know exactly where you're coming from. If I was in your shoes, I would watch every single dollar that I spend on marketing because in a small business, every single dollar counts, right? What I found from other business owners is at first, they didn't quite understand how this whole thing works. But having you had experience where sometimes people find you on the internet and they, then they come into your store and they visit your business and you ask them, how did you find us? Like, oh, it's through the internet. That if you are already getting customers by accident, imagine what you could do if you actually intentionally come up with a plan and more strategically have your website optimized, right? Being able to run certain ads on Facebook or on Google to bring you more customers. So that every single customer that comes in, is not an expense for you, it is an investment. So you spend a dollar, you get $3 back. Does that make sense? Feel, felt, found. That's, now, that's good. You don't hear exactly the word of feel, felt, found, but you see the formula by not fighting, not resisting the prospect. Yeah. So 
most of the time when most people do objection handling, they almost it almost feels like it's a debate. And it's like they say, here's the objection. Well, you know, like you're wrong because of this. But the key here really is empathizing with the people on the field step. Um, so if you can do that, your conversion rate is going to be instantly 50% higher is to really like listen to people. Okay. Right. Right. Um, so one example of this is, hey, I totally understand you have GitHub. I also know what it's like to work in an environment where you're really aggressive targets. You're using GitHub. You don't really want to change right now. What I found, however, is that with GitLab security scanning capabilities, we can actually speed up your overall engineering time. So what this means is that you can actually invest, um, you can have an advantage because your total engineering time is going to be shortened because of our security scanning capabilities. All right. Right. Cool. All right. So that's feel felt found. Um, next one that I want to talk about is lace. So Lace is basically, it starts out similar. So you listen to them, you accept it. But instead of what I found is XXX, you say something like, you know what? I totally understand that uh, GitLab Premium is more expensive than our free tier and you're on a limited budget, right? But how about this? If I can demonstrate to you that investment in the GitLab Premium actually saves you money, over a long one year time horizon, then how about, would you be willing to take a meeting so that I can go discuss that with you? All right, so that's the difference. Number one is you listen to it, you accept objection, and then mm -hmm. you actually propose something, you propose like, um, you propose basically like, hey, I'd love to show you something and in response, right? So. That, that that's not a really great explanation, but long story short, the difference is you make a commitment to sh share something additional with them or to address their objection. Okay. Right. Got you. So, um, Hey, I totally understand you have Azure DevOps. Tell me more about how this is working out for you. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's working out pretty good. Great. Are there features that you wish you had in your development process? Like, continuous security scanning. You know what, we we have some, but not very much. Okay, well, how about this? If I can show you a few examples of how this is something that we have and um, about how our security scanning saves you money overall in the long run and actually reduces your development speed, would you be interested in hearing more about that, right? So that's an example of a, a LACE technique. So the difference is, you still listen, you emphasize, then you say like, hey, if I could show you about how GitLab actually saves you money in the long run, then would you be interested in hearing more about it? So it's like, I am I propose something to you is the difference, okay? All right. All right, the last one that we are gonna talk about is pushback. Um, this is one that you have to use tactfully. And I'd say start out with the first two, go to pushback in the third one. But eventually what happens is you're going to be on a lot of calls. You're going to really understand this space. And sometimes it's important to respectfully challenge other people. So um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, so I'm talking to someone. Hey, uh, no, I, and then you get the objection. Like, hey, I don't, I don't want to, I can't, I can't meet with you right now. I'm really busy. All right. You, and then pushback is, hey, I totally understand that. You got a lot of projects on right now, but doesn't not do anything. Doesn't kicking the can down the road just mean that like you're never going to resolve any of these problems and you're always going to deal with problem X, Y, and Z, right? So okay. it's like respectfully saying, another way that I do it in calls is like, hey, I just like to respectfully challenge that, um, you know, like a, a really outdated way of thinking about some of these things is A, B, and C, but what a lot of new people are doing is X, Y, Z, right? Um, so so ju just let's just uh, review real quick. Feel felt found, hey, I really feel, I, I really understand where you're coming from. If I were in your position as a small business owner, I would also really make sure that like my budget was super streamlined. What I have found, however, 
is that GitLab actually saves people money in the long run, and it helps them to achieve their strategic objectives from an engineering perspective, right? So then that compared to Lace, hey, I understand that, you know what, like GitLab premium costs more than our free tier, but if I were able to demonstrate with you that premium actually saves businesses money in the long run, would you be interested in hearing more about that? And then the last one, pushback. Like, is like, I'd like to respectfully challenge that, you know, that's actually something that we've seen a lot of people, businesses doing three to five years ago. But really what we've seen in the last six to nine months is that security is now forefront. And that's something that we can't just sort of like has a second class citizen now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, anyway, how did that feel? <laughs> well, I, uh, I feel uh, what you're trying to teach me, these objections, and uh, what I've found is they're highly, highly resourceful, and other people have found them useful as well. So, <laughs> no, sounds really great. Yeah, I mean, I think having these in your tool belt really, you know, fill a lot of dead air when you inevitably get handed an, an objection. So, great tools to use. Awesome. Um, there, we actually have a lot of objection handling stuff over here. So, right. I was checking that out earlier. There's, there's a ton on here. Okay. Awesome. 